sermon text for today is taken from the book of Revelation. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, and on the gates the names of the 12 tribes of Israel were inscribed. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And the 12 gates were 12 pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl. Thus far the words of our text. Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Well, we are rounding out the Easter season, and that, I believe, uh, will be the last time we will greet each other with those words until next Easter season. Um, you know, I've, I've heard the question asked before. I think I even asked the youth group once. How, how, how can you know what you don't know? It's one of those philosophical questions. How do you know what you don't know? It's an excellent question. But I think for right now, as I was also stressing to the children, how can you see what you can't see? That's another good question there. How can you see what you can't see? So like, as we mentioned in the children's message, if you take a look around you, well, you see ordinary folks. You see regular, everyday people. You see the people you meet in the store and, and at school and on the street and the gas stations, you see at church, all of that, right? And, but, but what you can't see, you cannot see when you look at them the life experience that made them who they are. You can't see just by looking at someone all of the things. You cannot see their upbringing. You can't see how well or how, how, how they did in school. You can't see uh, athletics. You can't see uh, academics. You can't see um, extracurricular act. You can't see any of those things. You cannot see if they suffered a traumatic experience in their youth. You can't see if they had to grow up without one or both parents. You just see a person, but you can't see what makes them or that person who that person is. And I was thinking about this. I said, well, perhaps we'd all be a bit more compassionate if we could see the things that either wrecked our neighbor or gave them great joy. We probably would be more compassionate if we could see those things, but we can't. Now, the same is true of the church. When we look around the church, what do we see? We see individuals. We see people, individuals who make up the church, right? And we know from our catechism class, now this is where pastors get all you know, like excited, we get to talk about the catechism and all those other good things. But you remember from your catechism class, right? The visible church and the invisible church, right? So what is the visible church? The visible church is the church that we can see. That is the church at 205 Pulaski Street. That's this building and the people that are in this building. And the visible church is all the people in all the Christian denominations in all of the world. Right? But what is the invisible church? Ha! The invisible church is comprised of those people within the congregations who trust Jesus for eternal life. Okay? That's the invisible church. And that's what we, we can't see. We can't see somebody's faith. We can see what they profess. We can hear their words. But we just can't see what's really in each other's hearts. Right? But so that we can see what we can't see, God, through Jesus, gives to St. John a vision of the church in heaven. All right? So, right now, like right now, even as we're sitting here, the church bears the glory of Christ. That's what the church does. Now, of course, that is one of those things we can't see. We look like everyday, ordinary folks. 
we just can't see yet the glory that is ours through faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. St. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, and we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord, right, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. So currently, right now, without the veil of the law of God over us, with that being lifted through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are being, like ING, where it's an ongoing process, we are being transformed right now. Now you can't see that, but it really is happening. The transformation unseen by the human eye. You see, after the resurrection of the dead and the restoration of heaven and earth, the church will be adorned with glory for all to see. And I remember when we say the church, we don't mean, you know, we don't mean that. We mean us. We as the church will be adorned with glory for all to see. That's a pretty awesome thing. And so we get this picture of the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven and it's got all these doors and all these foundations and there's no lights in it and uh, the Lamb and God will be its light. And you've got all this wonderful, glorious picture, right? Because we can't see now what we really are. God gives us this revelation of what the church looks like in his eyes, the vision of this city, which is symbolic of the church, so that we see that the city has 12 gates with the names of the 12 tribes of Israel on them. What is that telling us? It is telling us that the church extends all the way back in history to Adam and Eve. Because the first promise of a Savior was given to Adam and Eve. And so the church has always existed. Right? And it travels through Adam's descendants. It travels up to Abraham and his descendants, the people of Israel, who are called the people of the promise. But that very same promise that was given to Adam, you remember the promise, right? right? You know, you will strike his heel and he will crush your head. Right? The promise of a Savior, Genesis 3, 15, 16, right, right in there. Right? Okay, so the promise that was given to Adam and Eve is the promise that a Savior would come, right? And that is the very same promise that we trust in, except for we trust that the Savior has already come, right? The one who would save us from sin, death, hell, and the devil. This is, this is who the people of God are. They are the people who have always trusted in the Savior, put their confidence in the Savior. Whether they were in the Old Testament or we in the New Testament, we are all trusting in the exact same Savior from sin. So uh, uh, our vision, okay, our vision is limited, though, as mortal creatures at this point. And we can only see our little piece of the whole history of the church of God. And, and with that, you know, come some, I don't know, limitations and visions. Like we see that we are, we are one link in a mighty chain anchored in the promises of God the Father that redemption is coming through the Savior who is Jesus Christ. Right? And we know that the church is built on the foundation of the 12 apostles. Okay. So in a time-bound historical sense, the church rests on the apostles and the prophets, and we are in no way isolated to ourselves. Right? The church has always been here. The church will always be here. It might not always be at this latitude and longitude, but the church will always exist because God will make sure that the church and the promises that the church contains will always be here. Right? And so we are in absolutely no way isolated in and to ourselves. Again, we can't see this, so Jesus gives the vision to John. Here, he says, is the church, the holy city Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. And, and we rest upon the faith and the labors of those who have gone before us, those who first proclaimed the gospel message. Right? So the gates of the 12 tribes and the foundation of the 12 apostles is intended to show us the unity of ancient Israel and the New Testament church. We are all one church, one church together. Right? That puts to rest any, any teaching that says there's a different way of salvation um, for the Jewish nation than there is for Christians. No. All people who are saved 
put their trust in the one and the same Savior, who is Jesus Christ. So, so, so John it has these, these images of all of these gates. And what is this image of gates meant to tell us, right? Is, is in the gates and the foundations. It is all imagery meant to tell us that there has been and only is one covenant between God and mankind, embracing all people of all times. And that is that those of old who by faith trusted the exact same promise that you all trust here today, that a Savior will come, and that Savior is Jesus of Nazareth, who is the long-awaited Messiah. He, he has come among us, He has ascended into heaven, and He will come among us again. Now, what do we do? We take this, and we connect this to the gospel reading for today. And in the gospel reading, what do we see that Jesus comes into Bethesda, into the pool, in, in the colony? He comes through a gate, right? So he's walking, so we're going to grab the gate imagery, we're going to pull these things together, right? Now, one of the things I don't think we're going to touch on today is there are all of these sick people laying around, all of these people who needed healed, and Jesus zeroes in, though, on one guy. Did you notice that? He didn't heal everybody that day. He didn't tell everybody, oh, you're healed. He zeroed in on one person, and he healed that one person. So there's got to be something to that. Why he didn't heal everybody, I have no idea. But there's got to be something to the fact that he zeroed in on and he healed one person. Okay? All right, now... The thing is, what we do know is that Jesus comes in, and he sees a man who, and the scripture is very specific about this, he sees a man who for 38 years had been set there, who had been waiting for healing and was unable to attain it. Now, there's some key in that number 38, okay? Okay. Uh, and, and, and what the number 38 is, the number 38 is the number of years that the Israelites were in the wilderness after God said, all right, I've had it with you all. You're a stiff-necked generation. You're a rebellious people. Not one of you who came out of Egypt two years ago is going to get into the promised land. Only your children will enter the promised land. Right? So... Here is a man who had been in the wilderness of illness and sickness for 38 years, just as the people of Israel had been in the wilderness 38 years after God declared that they would not go into the promised land. Okay? So it appears that Jesus, in his omniscience, selects one man who is to stand in for and represent the entire church. And this man who is waiting for healing, we're going to see in him the church militant. Because what is the church militant? The church militant is the church on earth, the church waiting to be raised to that eternal life described for us in the book of Revelation, that is the church triumphant. So you've got one man struggling, the church militant. That young, one man is granted healing, right? Take up your mat and walk. Be healed in body, mind, and faith. And we see in that healing then the church triumphant, that which we are headed for. And who does this healing come through? Of course, the healing comes through Jesus. Right? And so this is all very fascinating, right? What is it that Jesus does? He heals the man. Jesus simply comes with only his word and a declaration of his own power and his own might, and he speaks his word out and healing is brought. Are you a sinner? Have you sinned? Do you have sins that haunt you for your entire life? What does Jesus say to you? Be healed. In effect, when you hear the absolution, Jesus is saying to you, take up your mat and go home. You are healed. You have encountered the Savior of the world. And the Savior of the world has given you healing. 
Jesus speaks. The man is healed physically. Jesus speaks to us. We are healed spiritually. This is the language of creation. Christ spoke, and the man became just what Jesus declared, whole, whole in body, whole in his mind, whole in his faith. Here is the new creation through the forgiveness of sins and the granting of life, life that is to be lived as a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so we put all of this together, right? And we grab these different scripture readings that are laid out before us today. And, and what are we saying? We're taking out and saying, look, here the church struggles. The church on earth struggles. We have issues. We've got not only internal but external problems. The church doesn't look a thing like it really is. Right? By schisms set rent asunder, by heresies distressed. That's what the hymn writer says. Okay? Here, we simply cannot see who we are. Here, in this life, we struggle. Here, we are crippled. Here, we are lame. Here, we are longing for relief. That is what the church looks like today. And yet, we don't just have a, a, a small perspective like this. We have an eternal perspective. Jesus speaks healing to you. Jesus brings you life. Jesus gives you strength to endure the assaults of the world, the assaults of life. And he shows you just what your future will be in the vision of the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. The church will not need protection as it does here. That's what he says. There's 12 gates. Ancient cities had one gate. It's easier to protect. 12 gates. No protection needed because there's nothing that's going to hurt us. There's nothing that's going to assault us. There will be no night there, uh, the scripture declares, right? No night and none of the things that lurk in the darkness, be it physical darkness or the darkness of our own hearts. There will be only light and God will directly and personally live in the midst of his people and we will behold his glory. And the glory of God will be reflected in us and we will shine like the sun and we will be as glorious as the stars. That is what we are going to be. It's what we are now, but it has yet to be revealed in us. So this is the picture of the New Jerusalem. And what is the New Jerusalem? It is the church in glory, the church healed of all of her wounds and all of her hurts. And in this glorified church, there will be no more sin and there will be no more death. This is the resurrection. And it's what you and I are longing for. It's what you and I are waiting for. When our loved ones die, it is the hope and the confidence we place right there. The resurrection of the dead. A glorious reunion in heaven with those we love. This is what we have confidence in all because of what Jesus Christ has done for us and on our behalf. And so we know that we will be in glory someday. We know that it will be a glory when we die and our souls go to heaven to wait the resurrection of the dead, to be reunited with our bodies on the day of resurrection. We know it will happen when Jesus comes back. And that's what leads each and every one of us as the body of Christ here on earth and the church here on earth to simply say, come Lord Jesus. Come quickly. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may that peace which passes all understanding be in your hearts and your minds the one true faith in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. You have been sharing in the Sunday morning worship at Zion Lutheran Church, 205 Pulaski Street in Lincoln, Illinois, where you have just heard Pastor Mark Thompson deliver the message for this morning. Zion conducts worship services at 8 and 1030 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Sunday school for all ages is at 920 in our education building. We invite you to join us in person for this worship, fellowship, and Bible study. If you cannot physically be present, please join us every Sunday morning at 8 o'clock over WLLM 1370 AM or WLLM 90.1 FM or on translators at Lincoln and Springfield at 105.3 FM on your radio. Also on cable channel 5 on Saturday evenings at 5 and Sunday mornings at 10. 
Zion's worship services are also available live via the internet at www.zlclinc.org. Zion is a member congregation of the Worldwide Fellowship of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. If you are without a church home, we invite you to become a part of the Zion family. We, if we may assist you in any way, please call us at 732-3946 or write to us at Zion Lutheran Church, 205 Pulaski Street, Lincoln, Illinois, 62656. Zion also offers a premier education of Christian worldview for children from ages 3 through the 8th grade. Please contact our office at 732-3977. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.